we have the total derivative of a multivariable function, and the, the physical intuition for the total derivative is that it, the total derivative of f at p with respect to the velocity vector v gives you the instantaneous rate of change of f when you're at the point p and moving with velocity v. But suppose you fix the point that you're talking about. You want to know in which direction you should head to make f increase as rapidly as possible or decrease as rapidly as possible. Well then, of course, if you go twice as fast, you'll increase the function twice as fast because we can pull constants out of the total derivative. Um, so if you move in the same, you know, keep your direction fixed, but move twice as fast, it doubles the rate of change of the function. So if you're trying to compare just different directions, you need to fix the speed at which you're moving and then compare the rate of change of f in the different directions for that fixed speed. We don't want to fix the speed at zero, because then you're not moving at all, and the rate of change would be zero. And the most natural other choice is to fix the speed as being one, one unit, whatever the units are in your problem. So when you do this, look at the total derivative of f at a point um, in, with respect to a velocity vector that has magnitude one, so that you're moving with speed one, that's called the directional derivative because it just depends on the direction. And there, you get an easy formula, and it's easy to analyze in which directions you should head um, to maximize the rate of change, minimize the rate of change, keep the rate of change the same. And of course, the gradient vector is what it all boils down to. So um, suppose you've got f, some function of n variables, some real valued function. We have the total derivative d sub p of f at v. So I'm assuming, uh, as I'll assume throughout this lecture, that f is differentiable at p. And v is our velocity vector. And the formula we had for this is that it's the gradient vector of f at p dotted with the velocity vector. But now we want to fix the speed as being one so that we can just compare what happens in different directions. I remind you that we discussed quite a while ago that the direction of v, most directions don't have names like east, west, north, south. The direction of v is the unique unit vector um, that points in the same direction as v. Um, as long as v isn't the zero vector. So if v is not the zero vector, the direction of v is by definition the unit vector, the unique unit vector that points in that direction. So this is the direction of v. And what we want, we want to look at the total derivative of f in the direction uh, with respect to unit vectors so that we can compare the directions in which you know, the rate of change of f as you move in different directions. And then, of course, if you want to double that rate of change, you could just double the speed to so make the speed 2. Or you know, if you want to triple the rate of change, make the speed 3. Um, when you do this, so now u here is a unit vector, a vector of magnitude 1. When you do this, it is common to change the notation and subscript by u. And and write it as a function of p. So this is called the directional derivative. This is the directional derivative of f at p in the direction of u. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it's the instantaneous rate of change of f when you're at the point p and move in the direction u with speed 1. Okay, um, well, this is nothing other than our total derivative, and we've just restricted ourselves to looking at unit vectors. Of what possible use is this? Well, we didn't talk about 
rewriting this dot product formula in terms of the magnitude of the gradient, the magnitude of the vector, and the cosine of the angle in between, but that's what we're going to do now. So if you've got the directional derivative, so just remember this is just a change in notation from the total derivative evaluated a unit vector. It's the gradient vector of f at p dotted with u. But remember our geometric formula for the dot product. The dot product of two vectors is the magnitude of the first vector, so the magnitude of the gradient vector, times the magnitude of the second vector, but this is a unit vector, so its magnitude is 1, times the, times the cosine of the angle in between. So theta is the angle between the gradient vector and u. And it's really cool. This enables you to quickly decide in what direction you should head to make f increase as rapidly as possible, in what direction you should head to make f decrease as rapidly as possible, what directions you should head in to make f stay the or to not change at all. How is that? The co cosine. <laughs> cosine is always between plus and minus 1. So, and this is a positive quantity, or greater than or equal to 0. So the biggest this ever gets is when cosine is 1. The smallest this ever gets is when cosine is minus 1, and it's 0, so the rate of change would be 0 when cosine is 0. So um, if you remember this formula, that the directional derivative is given by the dot product, and the dot product is given by this, you can remember everything I'm about to say without having to memorize it as kind of separate things. It is the, so what do we conclude immediately? Um, the direction in which f increases as rapidly as possible is, well, we want this to be, the rate of change to be as big as possible. That's when the cosine is 1. Cosine is 1 when the angle is 0. So that means the angle between the gradient vector and u needs to be 0. They have to point in the same direction. As rapidly as possible, the direction is the direction of the gradient vector. Um, for that to have a direction, we would, we're assuming that the gradient vector is not the zero vector. So this is my e u, well, has to be then the gradient vector divided by its magnitude. So you can say in the direction of the gradient vector, but if you want a unit vector for the direction, then you need to divide the gradient vector by its magnitude. Um, I'll say again, if the gradient vector of f at p is 0, then this magnitude is 0, and the rate of change is 0 in all directions. So that's kind of the trivial case. But assuming that the gradient vector is not 0, well, let's do the non-trivial case, assuming this is not the 0 vector then this is the direction you head in to increase as rapidly as possible. And what is the rate of change um, when you move in that direction with speed 1? Well, it's what you got. We just made this 1, which means that the directional derivative is the magnitude of the gradient vector. Direction is my, that's the direction. And when you move, <coughs> so, and the value of the directional derivative, when you move in that direction, is the magnitude of the gradient vector. So 
this is kind of cool. You don't actually have to rederive this every time. It's you've got a function. You want to know you're at a point. You want to know in what direction you should head to make the function increase as rapidly as possible. It's in the direction of the gradient vector. And what is the rate of change of the function as you move in the direction of the gradient vector with speed one? The magnitude of the gradient vector. So that's kind of cool. Um, what if you want the direction which f decreases as rapidly as possible? Well, then you want cosine of theta to be negative 1. Well, cosine of theta is negative 1 when the angle between the gradient vector and you is, well, 180 degrees, pi radians. They point in opposite directions. So the direction which f decreases as rapidly as possible is the direction of negative the gradient vector. i.e. u is negative this divided by, I can put a minus sign there, but it wouldn't affect anything. So in the direction opposite, the direction of the gradient vector, and when you move in that direction with speed 1, the magnitude of the directional derivative is negative the magnitude of the gradient vector. So the directional derivative is negative the magnitude of the gradient vector. Suppose you didn't want f to change at all. Well then, uh, I mean, we could either look at it like this or like this. If you want the instantaneous rate of change of f to be zero, you want this dot product to be zero. And so that means that u needs to be perpendicular to the gradient vector. So, <clears throat> so the directional derivative f at p is zero if and only if u is perpendicular to the gradient vector. So this is it. This is how you answer every question about <laughs> directional derivatives. You remember the directional derivative is just the gradient of the vector dotted with the unit vector. You remember that geometrically that's the magnitude of the gradient vector times the cosine of the angle between the gradient vector and you, and then you draw all these other conclusions, um, which after a while you will remember without having to memorize them. The direction in which the function increases the most rapidly is the direction of the gradient vector. When you move in that direction with speed one, the instantaneous rate of change is the magnitude of the gradient vector. Uh, the direction in which f decreases as rapidly as possible is in the direction of negative the gradient vector. When you move in that direction with speed one, the instantaneous rate of change is negative the magnitude of the gradient vector. Um, to move, to have the instantaneous rate of change of f be zero, you need to move perpendicular to the gradient vector. All right, let's do some examples. So first, I should say, maybe I won't even call this an example. So, suppose you have a function of, of three variables. Then we have our three standard basis vectors for our three, i, j, and k. Uh, those are all unit vectors. They all have magnitude one. And This, the, the directional derivative of f in the direction of i at a point p, this is just the instantaneous rate of change of f as you move with velocity i. Um, this is nothing other than the partial derivative of f with respect to x. Hopefully that's obvious. If it's not, well, I could write that this um, is the gradient of f at p and then you dot with i, but that just picks out the x-coordinate. The x-coordinate of the gradient vector is the partial derivative of f with respect to x at p. So suppressing the reference to p, we just write the directional derivative of f in the direction of i is the same as the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And similar, similarly, the directional derivative of f with respect to j is just 
partial derivative of f with respect to y and the partial and the directional derivative of f with respect to k. It's the partial derivative of f with respect to z. So the, the directional derivatives where you fix a unit vector at the bottom are, you should think of them as, or you can think of them, as generalizations of the partial derivatives, but where you pick other unit vectors. All right, let's look at some standard types of problems. All these directional derivatives problems tend to look somewhat alike. The words change, <laughs> but what you do is always the same. So let's look at Let's look at the example f of x, y is x e to the y plus x cubed plus the sine of y. And we will fix our point um, where at p equals 1, 0. And what are standard types of questions? Well, um, what is the instantaneous rate of change? I'll abbreviate that as IROC. What is the instantaneous rate of change of f at 1, 0 when you move with speed 1? Towards the point two three. Um, in what direction should you head? as rapidly as possible. And what is the IROC of F in that direction? So, I mean, with, when you move with speed one, again, I get tired of writing that. And also, I said, when you move in that direction, if I don't specify a speed, I just say in a direction, it means with speed one. Um, and then, actually, a part C will make the same. C, same as B. but replace increase with decrease. So we want to know in what directions you had to make, in what direction you had to make F decrease as rapidly as possible. All right. All right. What do you do? Well, we need the gradient vector of f at p, and then everything else is pretty easy. So um, the gradient vector of f, the partial derivative with respect to x, we get e to the y plus um, 3x squared. The partial derivative with respect to y, we get x e to the y plus cosine of y. So that's the gradient vector at an arbitrary point. Um, at the point 1, 0, 
gradient vector there. At one zero, uh, you plug in x is one, y is zero, we get one plus three, comma, uh, one times one plus the cosine of zero, which is one. So we get four, two. So that's the gradient vector of f at the point. All right. What's the instantaneous rate of change of f at 1, 0 when you move with speed 1 toward the point 2, 3? All right. This is one of those little, little tricks that people like to throw into directional derivative problems. You are not given a vector that points in the direction you're interested in. You're at a point 1, 0. You're told you're moving to a point 2, 3. You need to find the vector from 1, 0 to 2, 3 then make it a unit vector, and then take the dot product to get the directional derivative. So we are after this, the directional derivative of f in the direction of u at 1, 0, um, where u is the unit vector. in the direction of the vector that goes from 1, 0 to 2, 3. All right. And this is the gradient of f evaluated, the gradient vector of f evaluated at 1, 0, dotted with u. And this, so this is 4, 2 dotted with u, and our whole problem really is to find this unit vector u. So we have, to, we have to write this vector in coordinates and then make it a unit vector, but aside from that, the problem is easy. So this vector, you subtract these coordinates from these coordinates, so you just get 1, 3. And so the unit vector u is 1, 3, divided by the magnitude of 1, 3. The magnitude of 1, 3 is the square root of 1 squared plus 3 squared. So it's the square root of 10, which isn't anything nice. So I'll just write this is 1 over the square root of 10 times 1, 3. So that's the unit vector. You need to be careful. In other problems, you might actually be given, it might say, not in the direction of some point, but in the direction of a vector. So in the direction of the vector this. And then you don't subtract the, the 1, 0. You have to be very careful about the wording. All right. So, okay, that's our unit vector u. And then you just need to dot that with 4, 2. So we get 1 over the square root of 10 times 1, 3. You just pull out 1 over the square root of 10. And then it's 1 times 4, so... Um, so there's a 4 plus 6, 2 times 3. So 10 divided by the square root of 10. The square root of 10. The square root of 10 what? Well, there weren't any units in the problem. But. So the instantaneous rate of change as you move with speed 1 in the direction of that point is the square root of 10. All right, so that was part A. Um, in part B, it's in what direction should you head to make f increase as rapidly as possible? In the direction of the gradient vector. In part B, you, you should be able to answer this immediately. This is in what direction should you head to make F increase as rapidly as possible? In the direction of so, the gradient vector of F at the point. And we found that to be 4, 2. So in the direction of 4, 2. If you want a unit vector for the answer, and that's typically what you want when you say in the direction. So the unit vector u that you would need would be 4, 2 divided by the magnitude of 4, 2. So that's the square root of 16 plus 4 
So 4.2 divided by the square root of divided by the square root of 20. We could simplify that, pull out a square root of 4, so that's 2, and you could, but anyway, this is the answer. It's not going to be real nice. You're going to have a square root of 10 in the denominator. So in the direction of that unit vector, that's the direction you head in if you want f to increase as rapidly as possible. Um, and what is the rate of change of f when you move in that direction? I mean, it's true you could take the gradient vector and dot it with that, but you should know what you get. You just get the magnitude of the gradient when you move of the gradient vector. When you move in that direction, exactly what you get is the magnitude of the gradient vector, which is the square root of 20. That's the fastest f can increase when you move with speed 1 from anywhere. Of course, if you move with speed 37 in the same direction, then you'd get 37 times this rate of change. But directional derivatives, you're specifically moving with speed 1. And then if you want to change your speed, just multiply by that later. But that's the direction. The direction you want to head in to make f increase as rapidly as possible is this one. All right, in part c, the question was, to, in what direction should you head to decrease as rapidly as possible? You shouldn't redo any work. It's just negative the direction of the gradient. And what is the rate of change of f when you move in that direction? Negative the magnitude of the gradient. So that's part C. So that's easy. We could do a part D. I didn't ask it. But what if, in what directions should you head if you don't want f to change at all? Let's do that part. So this is a, could be a part D. In what directions can you move? have the directional derivative equals zero, so that the instantaneous rate of change is zero. Well, this just means you're perpendicular to the gradient vector. So um, if we write u is a, b, and we want to figure out a and b, um, what do we need? We need that the gradient vector of f at 1, 0, dotted with u is 0. The gradient vector of f at 1, 0 is 4, 2. So it means that we need 4a plus 2b to equal 0. Now, you've got one equation, two unknowns. You can't solve for a or b. Um, you know, just as a number, but you can write one in terms of the other. Uh, for instance, you know, we get 2b equals minus 4a. So b is minus 2a. Which means your unit vector needs to be of the form a could be anything as long as b is minus 2 times a. So it could be a times 1 minus 2. But we need, we need for this to be a unit vector. We haven't put that in yet. So we also need, so we can let u be a scalar multiple of 1 minus 2 as long as, so where the magnitude of a is 1 minus 2 is 1. We, we need a unit vector. Um, this just means we need the absolute value of a times the magnitude of 1 minus 2, which is the square root of 1 plus 4, to equal 1. So it means we need the absolute value of a to be 1 over the square root of 5.
So a is plus or minus 1 over the square root of 5. And that's the answer. In what directions can you head to have the instantaneous rate of change of fb0? Um, there are scalar multiples of 1 minus 2. And um, if you really want a unit vector, you need to divide. It's uh, not just any scalar. It's just plus or minus 1 over the square root of 5. So um, if you look at the graph of f, and we'll do this more carefully in the next section. Uh, I don't mean. Actually, let me leave that, and we'll just discuss it in the next section. All right. Um, so that's the first example. Let's look at more physical example, so an example with some words in it. It's, um, this is a standard <laughs> kind of example with directional derivatives. It's uh, kind of interesting. On the other hand, if you think of it as a real application, it would mean you'd have to have an equation <laughs> defining a mountain or a hill for you, which isn't normal still. This is kind of a classic pseudo-application. So suppose you have a hill. And the altitude is as a function. all in feet. It's given by z equals 400 minus 5x squared minus 3y squared. So you should remember the graph of this is um, an elliptical paraboloid. So it looks very roughly like this. Um, so it's a hill. The x and y coordinates are measuring kind of your, uh, your, comp your longitude and latitude, or your position on the face of the Earth. And your z coordinate is your height, so it's the altitude. And so this somehow, mysteriously, you know the altitude of your hill in terms of your x and y coordinates. I'm going to ignore whether this is terribly physically relevant. <clears throat> Suppose you're at x equals 2 and y equals 10. So feet. In what direction should you head to ascend as rapidly as possible? So it's a little unclear. So I'm going to say in what x, y direction. ascend as rapidly as possible. Um, I said x, y direction because I'm thinking of like maybe in what compass direction, something along those lines. I just want, in terms of x and y, in a problem like this where you're thinking of you're given an x and y coordinate where you are, and you're asking what direction you should move, you, you might think kind of in space, no, for direction we mean in what x, y direction, and then yes, that would specify a z direction later, but that is not what we're asking for. So um, the function we're trying to make increase as rapidly as possible, if you're trying to ascend as rapidly as possible, is your height. So it's, the whole question is, in what direction should you head to make 
this function increase as rapidly as possible? Well, we know the answer. In the direction of the gradient. Right? The answer, you should be able to answer this question almost immediately. Mm -hmm. In the direction of the gradient. So the gradient vector of z at the point x is 2, y is 10. So we need the gradient vector of z. It is the partial derivative with respect to x, which is just minus 10x. And the partial derivative with respect to y, which is minus 6y. And then you really evaluate this at the xy pair. x is 2, y is 10. So if x is 2, you get minus 20. y is 10, you get minus 60. You can pull out a 20 if you want. This or that matter. 20 if you want, 20 times minus 1, minus 3. And if you really wanted a unit vector, so that's the direction you want to head in, in the direction of the gradient vector. But if you want a unit vector in that direction, you would take 20 minus 1, minus 3 and divide by its magnitude, well, you can immediately eliminate the 20 and divide by the magnitude of minus 1 squared plus minus 3 squared. So you just get minus, I'm going to pull out the minus sign, minus 1, 3 divided by the square root of 10. And that's, this is in um, meters. Uh, I take it back. Well, you know, in a way it's unitless because you're taking the partial derivative of z with respect to x and y. z has units of meters. x and y have units of meters, so this is technically unitless. So, all right. So, in that direction, um, is that physically reasonable that you head in the direction of a negative vector? Um, well, yeah. I mean, if you kind of look at the picture and think of this as being at the point um, 210, then, yeah, you kind of want to head in the negative direction in terms of x and y so that your z-coordinate will increase. Don't be confused. If you're headed kind of in a negative x, negative y direction, doesn't mean your z-coordinate will change in a negative way. It's easy to believe as you kind of move more toward, well, as you can see in the picture, as you move as your x and y moves more towards the center, you'll ascend more. more. So, all right, uh, that's a standard question. Let's look at one more. Let's look at a three-dimensional example. But as I said, a lot these problems, after a while, all start to sound the same. You do the same things. If you want the direction in which things increase as rapidly as possible, the answer is just you move in the direction of the gradient. Um, decrease as rapidly as possible, you move in the direction opposite the gradient. Um, so let's go back to an example we looked at in another section. Let's, we have the temperature in space. In degrees Celsius is given by T equals Z squared plus 0.5 E to the X squared minus Y squared, um, where X, Y, Z, I'm 
meters, and they're all, and this we'll assume they're between minus three and three. That, that minus three and three won't actually come in. It's just for the temperatures to be anything reasonable. I want to say something. Um, suppose we're at the point in space zero, one, two. What do we want to ask? The same types of questions you always ask in directional derivative problems. Um, We want to ask um, so A, what is the IROC of T in the direction of the vector? Three minus one zero, and well, B. In what direction should you head? To cool off. as rapidly as possible. And what is the instantaneous rate of change, so the I rock of T in that direction? And I mean when you when I say just in that direction without a reference to velocity, I mean in speed one. All right. Standard standard types of directional derivative questions. Well. Um the first example I, in the first example I did, we were at a point, and you're told you're moving in the direction of another point. We had to calculate a vector in that direction and make it a unit vector. Be careful. In this problem, you were asked for the instantaneous rate of change in the direction of a vector that you're given, not in the direction of a point. Um, you're given a vector, so we just need to unitize it. We don't have to create the, vec the vector in the first place. But we are going to need, of course, the gradient vector of, of t. So the partial derivative with respect to x, the partial derivative with respect to x, you'll get, you get the, the 0 0.5 e to the x squared minus y squared. But then by the chain rule, you, you, the one variable chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative with respect to x of the exponent, so you get a times 2x. The partial derivative with respect to y, you get the 0.5 e to the x squared minus y squared, but times oh, minus 2y, the partial derivative of the exponent with respect to y, and then the partial derivative with respect to z to z. So you can write this more nicely as 0.5 times 2, that just gives you 1. So x e to the x squared minus y squared um, minus y e to the x squared minus y squared to z. And at the point that we're interested in, 0, 1, 2, so you put in x is 0, well, that'll make this is 0. Put in y is 1, so we get a, a minus 1 times e to the 0 minus 1, so e to the minus 1, so minus e to the minus 1, and put in z is 2, so 4. Um, the units here are temperature units divided by the distance units. So this is degrees Celsius per meter. All right, so that's our, our gradient vector. And then, and then it's, you can answer parts A and B quickly. Part A, 
Um, the question is, what's the instantaneous rate of change if we move in the direction of the vector 3 minus 1, 0? Um, so you just need to make that a unit vector. So we want. So we've got a vector, 3 minus 1, 0. We want a unit the unit vector in that direction. So we have to take <laughs> 3 minus 1, 0 and divide by its magnitude, which is, again, the square root of 10. I don't think, want you to think that magnitudes are always the square root of 10. Um, that's just how it's working out in these examples. Um, All right, so that's our unit vector in the direction um, of 3 minus 1, 0. And so the value of the directional derivative, when, when you move in that direction of the temperature at, when you're at the point 1, 0, 2, it's just the gradient vector. The gradient vector dotted with um, that unit vector. So you get 1 over the square root of 10 times, you get a 0, you get an e to the, a plus e to the minus 1, and another 0. So you get e to the minus 1 divided by the square root of 10. Um, there is the question of units here, and I, um, it depends. I've been talking about moving with speed 1. If, if you're really moving with speed 1, then this would be in meters per second. Um, and this is your velocity vector after you made it have speed 1, so that would be in meters per second. And then when you dot this with this, uh, dot this with that, the meters cancel, and you get degrees Celsius per second. That's if you're really thinking of this as moving with speed one, which is how I like to think of it. Um, other people would leave the unit question up in the air and just give you a number. All right. Um, so that's the directional derivative, the instantaneous rate of change in the direction of the vector, 3 minus 1, 0. Um, what are we left? What do we have left to do? In what direction should you head to cool off as rapidly as possible? You should know that means you want the temperature to decrease as rapidly as possible. The answer is in the direction of negative the gradient. Your unit vector should be negative gradient vector at uh, the point, which is 0, 1, 2, divided by the magnitude of the gradient vector. Right? This is always the answer. In what direction should you head to make a function decrease as rapidly as possible in the direction of negative the gradient vector? But if you want to make it a unit vector, you have to divide by the magnitude. Negative our gradient vector is 0, e to the minus 1, negative 4, and you divide by its magnitude, which won't be anything nice. But so that's the direction you should head in to make the temperature decrease as rapidly as possible. And then what is the IROC when you move in that direction? Negative the magnitude of the gradient. So, so what is the IROC of T when you move in that direction? That's easy. It's just the, so it's the value of the directional derivative at the point 0, 1, 2, and it is negative the magnitude of the gradient vector, which is this number. So negative the square root of e to the minus 1 squared 
plus, well, I'll go ahead and write this, e to the minus 2 plus 16, whatever that is. Not a very nice number, but <laughs> that's, that's the rate of change. Uh, it's negative, indicating the temperature is decreasing. And if you want temperature to decrease as rapidly as possible, you head in this direction. All right. Those are all the examples I want to go over in this uh, basic part of the directional derivative section. Um, all these problems start to look alike to you if you just do enough of them. All the questions are the same. There are these small changes in wording that trick people like, you're at this point, you move in the direction of this point, or you're at this point, you move in the direction of a vector. But aside from that, all the questions are very standard. They should all start to look the same to you. Um, it shouldn't be too bad.